I'm not an academic. I can say that because many people have been saying, hello, professor, how are you? I'm not an academic. I'm actually an activist. I used to be a businessman. I used to run a consulting engineering company, one of the largest in, in Europe. And then I got very interested in what was going on in Latin America. And uh, among other things, uh, when I came back about 30 years ago, it was because <coughs> I wanted to be a full citizen. I was very interested in finding out how very sensible ideas were in getting through. So in a way, what I'll start off with now are my credentials and telling you about something that has not been published, but that is going to be published. It's coming out in a film. It's coming out in books. Let's see when it's ready. Uh, the idea is to tell you, try and answer that question of the previous session, why we're not getting there when there was a time that people that had our values uh, were getting there. My experience comes from actually being in the field, and I get familiarized with everything when, in Peru, we have a war. Uh, well, not a war, but something that produces many deaths as a war, something between 70,000 and 100,000 people, with a terrorist movement called Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path. And it's really in the course of the battle that uh, whatever I have to say comes. It doesn't come from the his history books because the other thing, you know, they haven't been written. Those that will be, be, that will be written in the future will be rewritten a hundred times. So this is, a, to a great extent, a personal experience. This is the history of the war of Peru with Sendero Luminoso, a Maoist terrorist movement that was born in 1980 and that was described by Secretary of um, State Eagleburger and by the U.S. Congress as the third worst attempt against Western civilization since Hitler and Pol Pot, first the lawyer one in Germany and uh, Cambodia. On your left axis are the amount of deaths. These are the, oh, those of the Commission of the Truth in Peru. You've got 2,000 deaths, 4,000 deaths, 5,000 deaths, 8,000 deaths, 10,000 deaths, 12,000 deaths, 14,000 deaths. On the horizontal scale, you've got 1980, when they erupted in Peruvian life, came into, till just about when the war was ended. The yellow line is, uh, is sent are the dead in the countryside, mainly those of, of indigenous extraction, Quechuas and some Aymaras, mainly. And the blue line is Lima, which doesn't even get to a thousand deaths in all that time, about 900. So Lima is frankly not, La Lima Conservadora doesn't know there's a war going on. They think they're living in Algeria and that once in a while a cafe blows up and isn't a damn shame. The war took place in the countryside. Now, the way it starts off is that Shining Path comes in and says, uh, we're going to take the countryside first, we're going to take the city afterwards, we're going to circle it. We first of all take over Sierra Maestra, get a reputation, then we take La Habana. And so at the beginning they were very popular, no deaths. But just about the second year, they discovered what we at my Institute of Liberty and Democracy knew since a long time ago, which was that the indigenous people had already began their quest towards private property and the Industrial Revolution. That there weren't communities, except in a political sense, that what there was was private plots. People had divvied it up among themselves. So when the communists tried to um, organized things collectively, they resented it. At that moment then, uh, as they did, did that, the deaths start going up. About 1983, 82, 83, it's no longer a police issue. Uh, President Belaunde brings in the army. In uh, point number six, a commission is created, a private commission, led by uh, a Nobel Prize winner, a very outstanding Peruvian and Spaniard called Mario Vargas Llosa, who does an analysis of the situation, publishes it from the New York Times and other places, and says the problem is 
that our people are primitive and they don't understand the law. They are gone and they're shooting each other because they don't know how to obey by law. And the general perception is that. The farmers on their own then form up here their own army, which they call Sistema Defensa Antisubversivo, and they go to war. And they go with spears, and they go with uh, slings, like David and Goliath, and they go with homemade guns that are called hechizos, made for hunting birds, generally do 50 meters, and then die. But they're very effective at the beginning because the Shining Path has got to beat a retreat all the way down here. But by that time that they're down here, they get the picture that they can't fight property on an individual basis, so they do something else. They say, we're going to defend it. And the result of it is that by 1988, they've taken over 60% of Peruvian territory, and the Rand Corporation of the United States, a military think tank, establishes then that they uh, will take over Lima by about 1992. Six U.S. generals. Uh, I remember there was a British general. Uh, Scudderbuck, I think he was. That's their conclusion. We get called in by President Garcia about 1987, who does various things to try and fight the war. And among other things, he says, you have a position in my organization that we have to learn to distinguish criminals from what we call informales which means people who are not against the law, but work somehow outside the law. So we give it various names like extra legal. The Oliver Twists of our time, the Jean Valjeans of our time, the kind of guys that in the States would get a silver star and they said, I like the way you shoot, son, uh, you're a U.S. Marshal. Somewhere there, you're a sheriff. And the problem that we have is that every time that the army moves in, they shoot everybody. It's just like the U.S. Army in Vietnam. Everybody's got a black pajama, so you shoot one and you shoot the other. And of course, we're not er gaining popularity. How do you distinguish between one and the other? And the reply is very simple. It's the guys that are fighting the shiny path who know who's who. We've got to bring them together. But every time we bring them together, there's a nudge of NATO and there's a nudge of the United States. And the nudge is no private armies. We don't like either the paramilitares of Colombia, and we don't like what you're doing. So the Peruvians stay off. They, they just see the United States as power. There's never been U.S. Marines in Peru. We're not the Caribbean, but they know where power is, and they don't dare move. So we are given the task at this time here of making the case for the United States, beginning of the end of the regime of Garcia, beginning of the regime of Fujimori. And we make a case by talking to different people. Here you will see the photograph of Dick Cheney, who is Secretary of Defense, Dan Quayle, Bill Crystal, And we're very much helped by the Heritage Foundation, which makes the contacts. And we say, we want to tell, tell you what we're about on the basis of American history. Look, our guys are not guns for hire. These guys that we want to make an alliance with are farmers. They're the Minutemen, Yankee Doodle. One guy with a flute, the other guy with a drum, and they're fighting for private property. Catch? They caught me. We say it's very hard to talk to cops, drug enforcement agency, great guys. We all agree there shouldn't be drug trafficking. But this isn't about that. This is about whether there's going to be a communist takeover of Peru. And we want to do it because we don't have the reputation as fighters as Colombians do, for example. Peruvians are much more Versallesco. They're much more old Spain, colonial old Spain. And so uh, we got to make a deal with them. And it ends up, this is the White House. This is to be published. From a point of Peruvian point of view, you're a very privileged people. Here's myself, General Brent Scowcroft. Here's President Bush and President Fujimori, and we seal the deal. We get the backing of the United Nations, which is where the American, Latin American sense of relationship works, because Javier Perez de Cuellar is Peruvian, and so he sends people in. And I travel throughout the country with 
U.S. Department of Defense, to see each one of the leaders here so that they can actually see that he's a poor farmer defending private property. Everybody understands that. And so, in effect, as you see, the deaths start going down. And by the time Abimael gets caught in Lima, he doesn't even have a guard with him, and deaths have come down to about a third of what they were. Uh, when he's caught, he writes in his last uh, memorandum, in his last book, called Las Dos Colinas, they have evicted us, it follows a plan conceived of and implemented by De Soto of the ILD, a direct agent of Yankee imperialism. If you're American, that's the last war you ever won. Since Peru won it, nobody's won. They've surrendered, but they haven't won. The state is still stuck in Afghanistan, still stuck in Iraq, getting restuck in Libya, and we Peruvians beat them. Beat them. <laughs> and the reason we beat them is because we had a conservative message. We simply said, you've got private property, we want to give it to you. So what we did is we titled them. But the thing isn't the title. The thing is, what is it they want titled? And what they want titled is essentially the records. The world is already staked out. And simply, the title is a representation of a social contract that exists on the ground. And so that's why we brought them in to Lima. Here it is. And the system was very simple. They were then given the authority, because we identified their authorities. We made them Peruvian marshals. We recognized who they were. They had the power. They could enforce. They could do compliance. We couldn't. And in the process, I remember that I used to go by. And as they started getting their different uh, titles, there's no picture of that here, I would distribute a title. They would sign in black, and President Fujimori would go behind with a red plumon and in Spanish say, ¿Y dónde está Sendero? And where's the shining path? Aquí, President. Now, we won that war. We didn't go to Havana. We won it in Peru. Right after, 340,000 indigenous enterprises born in Peru, and Peru, this is 1896, boom. Relatively speaking, we did really very well. Until today, where we've lost a sense of the past. Who helped us? Heritage Foundation, non-paid staff. Dick Cheney, Dan Quayle, he was actually foremost with his chief of foreign relations called Bill Fristel, and there's our friend Phil Trulock, who made the contact. Afterwards, when I said, aren't we going to celebrate a victory? Their reply was, what victory? What are you talking about? I mean, if Americans don't fight, there's no fight. What they did is they picked up the phone, and they made sure that we could do whatever we had to do. So it indicates that when conservatives know what it is you have to do, and they have to delegate, it kind of works out. Because nobody likes their country invaded by foreigners. It had to do with Peruvians getting involved. Now, did we have any idea of that actually happening? 